there are millions of surgeries that occur every year, and for most patients, these go very well. But for a subset of patients, they have post-operative complications. And it's up to us as clinicians to identify which patients are at risk, and then how do we manage those patients once they do develop a complication? Hello, my name is Dr. Chris Stevenson, and I'm a general internist at Mayo Clinic. And I'm excited to share with you our upcoming article titled Management of Common Post-Operative Complications, which will be published in the November 2020 issue of Mayo Clinic Proceedings. I'd like to thank my co-authors, Dr. Ari Mohammed, Dr. David Raslow, Dr. Elizabeth Gilman, Dr. Elizabeth White, and Dr. Deanne Kashawagi. Our article is part of a larger series of articles looking at the management of the perioperative patient. Past articles have covered topics such as cardiovascular risk stratification, or management of common cardiovascular complications. Our article focuses on management of common postoperative complications, including problems with kidneys, gastrointestinal complications, bleeding and anemia, postoperative fever, and delirium. Let's take kidney injury for an example. So we do several things as clinicians which might predispose our patients to developing kidney injury following their surgery. We have them fasting, so they're dehydrated. They may have blood loss following the surgery, so they have some hypovolemia. And we give them anesthetics, which could also lower their blood pressure. All of these can contribute to injury to the kidneys following the surgery. Furthermore, we give them medications after their surgery, sometimes NSAIDs, which can also be detrimental as well. So as providers, we need to be able to manage the problems with the kidneys, but we also need to identify which patients are at risk. And patients who have pre-existing kidney injury are more at risk than those who obviously don't. In fact, we know that patients who have chronic kidney disease with a creatinine two or greater are at an increased risk for cardiovascular side effects following their surgeries. A creatinine greater than two is one of the RCRI criteria. If we think about management of post-operative GI complications, one of the ones that is probably most common is postoperative nausea and vomiting. As a provider, you may say to yourself, well, that's fine. I'll give them an anti-emetic and they'll be on their way and everything will be okay. But you know, patients are more concerned about postoperative nausea and vomiting than they are with pain when patients have been surveyed. And upwards of 80% of patients experience postoperative nausea and vomiting. This contributes to increased hospital stays and increased healthcare costs. So it's important as us for providers to know which patients are at an increased risk for postoperative nausea and vomiting. In our paper, we discussed ways to risk stratify our patients and then how do we manage those patients who are at higher risk? Maybe for patients who are at lower risks, we don't give them any prophylactic antiemetics. But for patients who are at higher risk, maybe we do prophylax them or we use multimodal prophylaxis from several different agents. When we think about other complications, bleeding and anemia is also a common postoperative complication. Obviously, following surgery, there may be some blood loss, and it's up to us as clinicians to identify where is the threshold for transfusion. Should we practice more restrictive or more liberal transfusion thresholds? Individualized decisions need to be made for your patients based on their past medical history. Certain things such as a history of coronary artery disease may make you want to have that threshold a little higher. And what about our patients who have pre-existing anemia? If we have an upcoming elective surgery, there may be a role to consider IV iron to help replete their iron stores prior to surgery. Fever in the post-operative setting can also be a challenge. We know that the time of the fever, maybe if it's a couple hours after, compared to if it's a couple weeks after, really changes our differential. If a fever develops within the hours after surgery, we start to think, what did we do to the patient? Maybe we gave them a medication or blood product and they're having a reaction to that. Compared to if it's several days after, we need to think about other sources of infection. Thinking about pneumonias, urinary tract infections. What lines do they have in place? Do they still have an indwelling catheter? And as we move out, we think about surgical site infections. Lastly, delirium. Delirium is a common complication that we see in the hospital as providers, and it's also common in our post-operative patients. There have been meta-analyses which have looked at 
pharmacologic treatment options for delirium, and it found that haloperidol and our second generation antipsychotics may not be as effective for managing delirium. So what's a doctor to do or a provider to do? Well, we have non-pharmacologic options, including making sure that we reorient the patient, appropriately address their pain. Because remember, they're post-surgical, so they're going to have post-surgical pain. But if we have too much pain medication on board, well, that can also make the delirium worse. And so the big picture for this paper is to provide you, the clinician, with a tool set to help manage your patients in the post-operative period. If they have kidney injury, how do we first risk stratify the patients, but then how do we manage that kidney injury? For GI side effects, how do we address which patients maybe have post-operative nausea and vomiting, and then which ones do we consider prophylaxis? For bleeding and anemia, what are our thresholds? for transfusion. For fevers, what's our differential as the time marches out after their surgery? And lastly, delirium, what non-pharmacologic options do we have that we can use and when do we have to use the pharmacologic options? I hope you're able to use this tool set to better care for your patients in this upcoming article. Thank you so much. We hope you found this presentation from the content of our website valuable. Our journal's mission is to promote the best interests of patients by advancing the knowledge and professionalism of the physician community. If you are interested in more information about us, our home page is www.mayoclinicproceedings.org. There you'll find access to information for our social media content, such as additional videos on our YouTube channel or journal updates on Facebook. You can also follow us on Twitter. More information about Healthcare at Mayo Clinic is available at www.mayoclinic.org. This video content is copyrighted by Mayo Foundation for Medical Education and Research.